I'm Kirk Harnack. On This Week in Radio Tech, I'm joined by Chris Tobin and Jim Roberts from Broadcast Electronics. We talk about penalties for pirate radio broadcasters. Plus, we get an in-depth look at RDS and web metadata interactivity tools for radio broadcasters. Twert is up next. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for This Week in Radio Tech is brought to you by CashFly at C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com. This is This Week in Radio Tech, episode 88, recorded June 22nd, 2011. The Radio Experience. This Week in Radio Tech is brought to you by Axia Audio and the new Radius IP Audio Console. Feature-rich, affordable IP audio consoles on the web at axiaaudio.com. It's time for This Week in Radio Tech. Hello there. I'm Kirk Harnack, your host. And Hey, today I'm not in my usual uh, office confines. I'm coming to you from Singapore today. The Broadcast Asia Convention and Expo is going on uh, this week in Singapore. And uh, my employer, Telos Omnia Axia, is displaying there. So that's why I'm here. It is uh, actually, as I'm speaking to you, as we're recording this show uh, here in Singapore, it is um, about quarter after seven on Thursday morning. But uh, for everybody else, it is still Wednesday evening. So glad you're with us. I've got a show today that we're, uh, we're really excited about because it it, we're going to hear from an expert where we, uh, on a subject we've been talking about uh, quite a bit, uh, well, here and there. And, you know, uh, I, I wish I was more expert at, at this subject. Well, tell you what, we'll get into it here shortly. Let me introduce my co-host. Chris Tobin is with us on the show this evening. Hey, Chris. Hello, Kirk. I hope all is well by you in the part of the world you're in. It's well enough. <laughs> I just Excellent. got up. <laughs> Well, I work with the CBS radio group here in New York City. Uh, we have six radio stations, 3 a.m. and 3 f.m., and as broadcast technologist for the group, my job is to keep things on the air along with making sure studio operations are f fluid and uh, flawless, as well as finding technologies we can use to uh, make money with. So uh, it's, it's fun times. And we use uh, BE products, so Jim Roberts is uh, no stranger to our operation. And so speaking of BE products, uh, our guest here, uh, Jim Roberts from Broadcast Electronics. Hello, Jim. Hi, how you doing? I'm good. I'm good. Thanks for agreeing to be, uh, to be on the show. Um, sure. You were highly recommended by one of your cohorts. And uh, mm. so we're very glad to have you on and to talk about, um, well, you tell us what we're going to talk about. I'm not sure I've got all this story straight. Well, I'm the product manager at Broadcast Electronics, so I, the software product manager. So I'm involved in just about everything we do software-wise, and that ranges from uh, you know our Audio Vault automation suite to uh, the Radio Experience software, which actually I have more of an uh, intimate knowledge about, and then uh, some new products we've got, like uh, Crowd Control, the new interactive um, thing that we're doing. So there's, there's a lot of stuff in there. There's RDS, there's HD, there's the new artist experience stuff, so we can talk about all of that. Well, good deal. I'm I'm excited to talk about that because I'm interested in in uh, how, all the things you can do with with metadata, uh, both mm -hmm. on uh, let's say an RDS channel, which is kind of old hat, but uh, I think it's still probably getting a little more sophisticated as we go along. And then metadata for streaming, and so, so people can enjoy some more rich content from broadcasters. Um, you know, mm -hmm. I'm part owner of a few radio stations, and we're doing just a very limited amount of that. I'd like to understand how to do more. I want to tell you that our program is brought to you by Axia Audio. On the web at axiaaudio.com. Axia Audio, my employer. Uh, they are makers of some really cool audio consoles that use uh, audio over IP. You ought to check them out on the web at axiaaudio.com. Uh, here at the Broadcast Asia Show, uh, we are showing the, uh, of course, the Element console that's been around for quite a while, the uh, IQ console, which we've been showing for a year. It's finally now shipping. And it's the expandable console that costs about half of what an element console does. And then there's the radius console we'll be shipping within the next month or so. Um, so check it out on the web, axiaaudio.com. Hey, let's get to a couple of topical items. Um, I, I noticed that uh, the New York State Legislature has passed a bill. Uh, it adds jail time, potentially jail time, to the possible penalties if someone in New York State 
is convicted of operating an illegal radio station. Now, that's, this is surprising that a state is, is doing this. Uh, I, I didn't think they had any jurisdiction or say so in, in this area, but we'll see what happens. Uh, the story is lawmakers in Albany, New York, uh, they passed legislation that makes it a Class A misdemeanor to operate an unlicensed radio station in the AM or FM band. Uh, according to the text, the measure creates the crime of unauthorized radio transmission and prohibits knowingly making a radio transmission on radio frequencies assigned and licensed by the FCC uh, for use by AM and FM radio stations. Um, the measure is similar to laws in Florida and New Jersey, giving local authorities some say over what previously had been a federal-only area of jurisdiction. Now, while pirate radio can pop up almost anywhere, uh, those three states are among the states where the problem tends to be the most acute. Well, I've driven around Miami and, you know, every other channel position is a, a pirate radio station. Uh, Mr. Tobin, what, what's the pirate radio situation like in, in New York? Oh, we have none. It's quiet. It's very, very tamed operation. The marketplace, there's nothing going on. Oh, my goodness, you can uh, swing a dead cat in Times Square and hit at least a dozen you know, pirate radio stations on the dial. Uh, it's, it's been around a long time. It's become a, probably, I won't say epidemic, but definitely more than ever before in the last, I say, five years. And I know there's several in the outer boroughs that you can pick up. Literally every blank space there is on the dial, you'll find somebody. Um, whether legislating you know, jail time makes any sense, I say no. But you know, why not just give the FCC the resources to go after them? And how about a stiff penalty? Not the you know, $200 or $1,000 fine. You know, $10,000, maybe 30 days of uh, civic duty, you know, that kind of thing. Rather than my tax dollars putting somebody in jail for what? To wait for a, you know, a hearing that may take place when? Three, four, five, six months down the road? You know, I was wondering, in New York City or Miami, uh, is is even ten thousand dollars the kind of fine that's going to get somebody to uh, pay attention and, and stop that illegal activity? I mean, aren't I oh, had no. heard that, for example, in Miami, some of these pirate stations are fronted by record labels. Oh yeah, yeah. No, the, the, what's unfortunate is that there's no way to really curtail. I think pirate broadcasting. It's been around for a long time. I think it's never going to go away. But I think what needs to be done is some disciplinary action, at least to say that if you're going to do this you're going to need to be prepared to get harassed properly. I mean, we got pirate broadcasters in the New York metropolitan area. There were churches. And I've, I've <laughs> talked to folks who are in the enforcement area. They're like, look, uh, you know, we don't touch these things. It just, you know, it's a church. It's like all of a sudden becomes a whole political thing. So how do you, you know, argue that? And then, you know, legislating what? So what's the criteria? Who's going to find them? How you go about, uh, you know, is it a complaint? The FCC isn't actively looking for pirates. They've got other things to worry about, and their offices are understaffed as it is across the nation. So I, I don't know. I think it's a waste of you legislation. Know, th th that impresses me as actually a big part of the problem, that the, off the FCC is understaffed for enforcing this kind of thing, and, and they'll Absolutely. only uh, uh, assign the resources when it gets really bad or it, it starts affecting maybe a station, maybe a licensed station that's politically well-connected. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, you know, for FCC office to chase after a pirate, first of all, they have to be made aware of it. So how do you become aware of a pirate broadcaster? Well, the commercial broadcasting group could uh, let somebody know at the FCC office. Then you file a complaint. You do the paperwork. Then the FCC will then have to make time to go out and monitor that and see if they're around. Well, these pirates are very good at being elusive and know that, you know, if they stay on for a short time, go off, come back, the odds of them being caught are minimal because they're not there when the inspectors come looking for them and I think uh, you know if you want to really curtail or at least minimize the impact of broadcasters commercial broadcasters who I'm sure the the lobbyists behind this legislation then you know what give the FCC some uh, um, uh, what do you call it staffing maybe staff the field office with somebody at the monitoring point you know they have monitoring receivers all around the country they're able to remote into they can listen to things like there's no tomorrow so why not just you know staff it and have them monitor the uh, airwaves and check out what's going on. And then as soon as they detect something, you have to dispatch somebody out to, to uh, catch them in the act. Because I believe the current rules and the way the U.S. Marshals and the FCC inspectors, when they arrive, have to catch you in the act, at least to some degree. Otherwise, it's just hearsay. You can have an antenna on the top of your house. You can appear to have a broadcast facility in appearance, but if there's nothing coming out of it, who's to say that I'm using anything illegally? And I only say that because a friend of mine who's retired is a former FCC inspector from many years ago and told me the hardships they have and, you know, their hands are tied to some degree. And, and those who violate the rules know it. So, you know, I think that's where, where focus needs to be put. 
not uh, legislating, oh, you're going to get put in jail. Yeah, so what? You get put in jail for a dime of marijuana. Uh, does that stop anybody? No. <laughs> <laughs> what? You know, I, Nelson I Rockefeller took care of that one. Yeah, yeah. I thought some years ago, um, when the FCC was enforcing people who had uh, illegal CB linear amplifiers, that, um, and maybe the source I heard this from was wrong, but I thought that if you were just in possession of one, you could, were legally assumed to have used it, and uh, it would be confiscated, and, and you could be charged with whatever, whatever, whatever the charge was. Now, if, if that's true, if what I heard about that was true, then it seems that the laws affecting uh, the enforcement of pirate radio are, are different. That just because you possess the equipment doesn't mean that you can be uh, assumed to have used it. That's correct. I think there's been some challenges to that. And some people have said, well, why not just have them pay down the fine or give them the option to pay for or get a license of their own? Unfortunately, it's not that simple. Uh, you know, licensing of radio station allocation in any market goes through a series of uh, you know, regulations, and you know, it's not that easy to do. If the allocation is not available, that's not available. Most pirates usually operate within the guard band channels of the FM stations uh, throughout the dial. You know, as we know, they're all uh, separated by 200 kilohertz. So uh, you, know, you, you wouldn't be able to put a licensed station in there. And in a typical market, won't you typically find uh, FM stations? Um, now, if, if you look at your spectrum analyzer in a typical market, maybe not New York City, but you'll find a station, what, about every 800 kilohertz or, or Yeah, something like that, that yeah. Yeah. Uh, so uh, you might have a station at uh, uh, 92.9 and um, at 93.7 and at 94.5. That's a typical spacing that you'll find. And so sure. people who want to operate a pirate <clears> radio <throat> station – will think, oh, well, there's all this space between these stations. I'll just go on there. And, of course, stations are spaced the way they are uh, for several reasons. One of them is the, the capabilities of receivers. Can they discern you know, between, between stations? And you kind of have to design for um, the, uh, the lowest common denominator uh, receiver. And then there are stations that are out of your market on those channels that are between the ones that you may hear in your market, and your pirate station could easily, uh, you know, could affect the, the fringe operation of those other stations. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think the, the, the goal here should be to find a proper way to enforce the rules. I'm a commercial broadcaster, and I know for a fact on many occasions, one of our three FMs at any given time will have somebody broadcasting, it will say, without a license, on the first adjacent channel to our station, and in some of the boroughs, it's difficult to hear our station because of the capture effect, you know, the, the overloading of the receiver. And yeah. um, I can document it. I'll go out and make sure I have records of every time they're on. But there's no mechanism in place for me to call the FCC office and say, hey, guys, we got something here. Here's what I've done so far. There's a pattern. I think I know when they're going to be on next. We could be there to catch them. There's no mechanism in place. They can't do that. They're like, okay, thank you for the information. You filed a complaint. We'll take it from here. Now what? I've wasted time. I, there's nothing they can do because these are the rules. That's what needs to change. You know, they need to be able to respond in some reasonable time when somebody calls to say, I've got a complaint that's causing my business uh, an impairment. You know? And then, then you get into that whole uh, argument. Is it you know, business? It's commercial. What right do we have? And you know, it, it just gets a little wacky. Hey, if, um, if, a, if an FM radio station uh, is, in fact, interfered upon by a pirate, can that station take civil action against the pirate? Hey, you, you caused me a decrease in my, in my licensed listening area. Thereby, therefore, you cut back on the number of listeners that are available to our station. And, 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 uh, therefore, and look, our ratings went down by, uh, by four-tenths of, of a point. It, it, wouldn't that be a, a civil case? You probably could make a civil case. The question becomes uh, your burden of proof, uh, whether the uh, material you prove is them. How do you know that it's them that you're recording? Because if you took yeah. a picture, say you – here here you go. I say I'm called upon to go out with maybe our attorney, a corporate attorney, just say. We go out to a place that we believe is interfering with our signal. It's a pirate operation. We'll call it that since that's the terminology these days in the, in the, in the readings. And we say, okay, we're at the corner of McGillicuddy and uh, 15th Street. And in that house, somebody's broadcasting illegally because I have a field strength meter with a calibrated antenna pointing at the house. Receiving a signal field strength is sufficient to overcome my local commercial radio station signal. That may not be enough because what proof do you have other than pointing at a house? Unless you knock on the door 
and enter the premises or ask them are they broadcasting and they say no and you enter. It, it, you could probably do civil case, I'm sure, but I have a s sneaky suspicion that it's going to be very difficult to do it right. Whereas yeah. if the FCC is brought out with that same pr material, they can go in as a federal agency and say, we believe we have sufficient uh, uh, cause that you're operating illegally as per the rules, blah, 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 and as a federal agent representative of the government, we need to uh, you know, inspect what's going on. Me as a civil person, I can't set foot on somebody's private property. You know, I can knock on the door and they can refuse me access. That's it. I'm done. What proof do I have other than a field strength meter and pointing at a house? Who's to say the house is actually the source? It could be behind the house. It could be you know, many other things. Maybe they radiate, the signal is radiating from that house, but the actual uh, equipment that's causing the, the illegal act is located two doors down. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's a shame that it's a, it's a shame that radio waves are so invisible. I mean, what if we had like you know RF spray? We could spray it in the air. <laughs> ah, yeah. See, see, it's coming from over there. Really, it is. And then you could you know, videotape that and have have evidence. Yeah. I mean, you know, years ago when I was growing up, I, you know, pirate radio was around when I was a kid. But the one thing I remember when I used to talk to some of these these pirates, if you will, they were all about being technically sound doing everything as if they were a commercial operator, even to the point to prevent second uh, adjacent interference if they were in between stations. <laughs> Modulation huh. was, was kept within the proper limits. Uh, I mean, it was, it was interesting. I mean, I learned a lot from talking to these guys over the years back as, you know, as a kid. But today, when I go out and look and listen, there is just no regard for anything we do in, in the industry. And th that's what I think is the real egregious act. That's what's really annoying. So if you're going to do it, at least follow the rules. Yeah, you're in the sandbox <laughs> with the other guys. At least, you know, appear as if you're trying to do something right. We, Maybe we nobody had a pirate station here in Quincy for a while, and they prided themselves on the fact that they were following the rules. They had a website, and the only rule they were breaking is they didn't have a license. And exactly. They probably weren't paying music <laughs> licensing either. But they, uh, they were following all the rules. They were on an open frequency. They were within modulation. Yeah, well, I'll tell you, you want to shut down a pirate... Don't bother with legislation and, and, uh, and, and uh, what do you call it, arrests or, or, or incarceration. Contact the RIAA <laughs> and just simply tell them, look, I think you're missing out on some royalty fees here. You might want to talk to these folks at this address and uh, we'll see what happens. Because they're quick to get people on the Internet, you know, 60-year-old grandmothers with their kids and stuff. So why not? It's another revenue stream for them or I'll call it non-traditional revenue. How's that? But, uh, you, yeah. you know, I, I don't know if my attitude is, was, was right about this, but back in the debates about LPFM and whether we should allow LPFM, <clears throat> I, w I was and still am a, a commercial station uh, owner, you know, full, some full power stations. And we have to pay uh, plenty of money to the various uh, music licensing organizations like ASCAP and BMI and CSAC. And it's a it, it's it's a burden for uh, for uh, small stations and big stations alike. It's a lot of times based on on revenue and, or or market size. So um, uh, when when uh, the LPFM crowd was saying, "Hey, we deserve to have a voice too, to be on the air. You should you know change the rules to allow LPFMs on the air." My attitude was, you know that that's fine, um, but don't think you're going to open up your station and run it for five hundred dollars a month. Uh, if you're going to play music, if you're going to start you know. If you're going to be on the air, uh, play by the same rules that we have to, and you'll f maybe quickly find out that it's not a walk in the park. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I would agree. Um, yeah, LPFMs have a place. I think they're, they're definitely uh, well-suited in many parts of the country. They work out very well. Some of the more congested cities like New York, Chicago, and Boston, it may be a little more difficult. But you know what? You can create rules that would apply to those particular regions, and, and it's not yeah. uh, something that wouldn't be new because if you look in the rules you'll notice there are certain rules regarding FM transmissions around the United Nations here in New York City or along the border in Mexico and, and the Canadian border as well so you know you, you can do rules that would be applicable to certain areas that you know limit you know LPFM would be limited because of that and play by the same rules that we all do if BMI ASCAP is based on revenue and then you pay your licensing fee accordingly if it's based on market size then you do it accordingly but yeah, I you know I think the smart approach would be to to do the rules intelligently and and apply them properly. Just to say one rule for all because it doesn't work that way. And, and we've known that for years with many Part seventy three and Part seventy four regulations in the FCC book. 
Jim, uh, you mentioned a moment ago about uh, pirate stations uh, even having websites, and, and actually that gives rise to a question that's been in the chat room too. Hey, uh, you know, now that there's the internet, you can you know you can do webcasting on the internet. Is there as much call for? I mean, is there as much demand for people to run pirate stations? And apparently the answer is yes. People still want to be on the terrestrial frequencies because guess what? That's where listeners. That's where people. That's where ears still are, especially especially in the cars. Um, uh, Jim, what's your what's your thought about that? Since since uh, you know, you'd think that hey, anybody who wants to be a broadcaster can. I mean, this network, the Twit.tv network, it's not licensed. It doesn't need to be. It's not an over-the-air terrestrial broadcaster. It's it's on the internet. It's not free because there's a lot of bandwidth to, to be paid for. Um, J Jim, give us your thoughts on that about webcasting versus uh, pirate. Well, I, I think it's probably easier to be found um, if you're broadcasting over the air, ter terrestrial radio. How many radio stations or streaming stations are there on the Internet? It's kind of hard to get discovered. If you go to Live 365, you know, you're buried in hundreds of thousands of them. Um, but if you're in your community and you're on the dial with, you know, 10, 15 other stations in the community, it's much easier, I think, to be found. You may not be found by as many people but it could be more relevant to those people that do find you. I mean, you know, on the Internet, it's, it's one station today and another station tomorrow, but if I'm broadcasting in a community, uh, you know, just like traditional radio, I'm more of a part of, of somebody's life. I'm more of a part of that listener. I'm, I'm able to touch that listener in ways that you can't online. Mm. That's true. Yeah. yeah. Gotcha. Well, we kind well, of... You know, the other thing... Uh, oh, sorry. Yeah, go, go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to say, the other thing you can do, I know for a fact from listening to some of these pirates, they uh, sell commercial time. They actually have commercials. So <laughs> why not just call the tax man and say, hey, you're missing out on some revenue for the state or even the federal government. You might want to investigate these particular locations. I bet you get some action there. And as the discussion earlier, music licensing probably isn't as much as an issue over the air as it is for a pirate is streaming. You're going to get nailed pretty quick if you're streaming, I think. But oh, if yeah, you're a pirate, definitely. probably not. Yeah. Huh. So I've, I've, uh, in Miami, I've seen pirate stations, uh, commercial rate cards. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. A friend of mine was telling me about a, a pirate in, in Brooklyn, uh, downtown Brooklyn, was it? Or Bed, uh, Brownsville, Brownsville, Brooklyn, which is sort of the eastern part of the borough. And <laughs> they have a rate card website and a storefront display. <laughs> and they're, <laughs> they're doing the broadcast. And they were actually well, doing it during the Haiti. Uh, catastrophe, the natural disaster in Haiti, they were actually doing live conversations with family members. They were connecting people with folks in Haiti. And, you know, not, not that I'm condoning, you know, illegal operation, but here is an op here's a group of individuals doing everything you would like to do as a broadcaster and just they don't have the license. Yeah. And it sounds like they were, you know, perhaps doing some good that way. They were b being a yeah, service. They were. Yeah. yeah, That's, you know, again, that's why the rules need to be addressed and looked at and say, what can we do to maybe you know, find a way to squeeze in these low power FMs or operations of community radio stations or something to that effect. You know, but I know did, the lobbyists from the commercial side are probably, mm -hmm. you know, downplaying that considerably. Depending on who you ask, uh, in Brazil, upwards of uh, a third to half of the stations on the air are, are pirate stations. Uh, I don't know if the government, you know, winks and looks the other way. Uh, I guess they do. These pirate stations, you know, buy plenty of, of equipment. Um, you know, it, it, and, and speaking of, of equipment distribution to pirates, you know, nowadays with eBay it's, uh, and, and uh, a whole lot of, of companies uh, dealing in, in broadcast gear, it's not so hard uh, to go buy a license, I mean, to, me, to go buy an antenna, some coax, a transmitter, uh, to buy an audio processor, and, and of course a console, that's a studio item. Um, you know, back in, in years ago, it was probably a lot more difficult to get this stuff. If you were a Harris Corporation or a Broadcast Electronics or a Continental Electronics, um, I, I'm not sure that your policy would allow you to knowingly sell a transmitter to someone who wasn't licensed, even though that, I don't know that it would be illegal. Uh, I would suppose that people probably had such a policy. Uh, Jim, uh, Broadcast Electronics, uh, uh, how how do you guys handle you know pirate calls up and says yeah I want to buy a transmitter, what, I, what goes I, on? I don't know that there's any kind of policy, um, but I think we certainly on an as needed basis would raise question and and could refuse the sale. I don't know that we ever have. Um, I think you're right about eBay. It's so easy for you know someone nefarious to acquire that equipment in other ways than than calling us directly. 
Um, but, you know, there are so many LPMs out there now, and, and they're ordering stuff. Uh, and even a commercial station. Who's to say a commercial station isn't ordering it for someone else? Uh, you know, we can't really track sure. that. Sure. Yeah, well, I guess the point is it's not hard to, to go yeah. get on the air. Yep. Not, <clears throat> not hard at all. Um, <laughs> somebody in the chat room here. Uh, oh, my gosh, I just uh, – oh, yeah. <laughs> somebody in the chat room says, uh, in fact, uh, Joe, uh, Joe to Max, my pirate radio station uses exclusively Telos gear. <laughs> <laughs> well, Telos doesn't make any transmitters, so uh, you know, that's, we're, we're, in, we're in, the, in the clear there. Hey, but in fact, speaking four of Telos – five pirates. Yeah, I'm sorry, go ahead. Telos gear preferred by four out of five pirates. <laughs> yes, there you go. <laughs> hey, we're, we're going to get into the meat and potatoes of our conversation with, uh, with Jim um, and here in just a second, Jim Roberts from Broadcast Electronics. I'm going to take a moment, though, to tell you about our sponsor of this episode of This Week in Radio Tech. Uh, thank goodness they're my employer. I love working for them, but they also uh, approached me and said, hey, can we sponsor your podcast? And I said, well, sure, absolutely. Uh, it's Axia Audio, makers of audio audio consoles and audio routing systems that work over Ethernet. Now, it's not, you, know, you can use Ethernet and Ethernet protocols to do a number of things that are not IP compliant. Uh, for example, uh, things like CobraNet or EtherSound. Uh, these are other commercial, uh, other protocols for getting audio between here and there, but not necessarily suited well for the needs of a broadcast environment. And that's where LiveWire comes in. Uh, we have some engineers uh, over in Latvia who worked several years back, uh, six, seven, eight years ago, to develop a way to get low latency, unbuffered, uh, and um, linear audio digitally over a, a completely Ethernet IP compliant environment. And uh, so it runs through standard switches and fully compatible. In other words, you can, on a live wire audio over IP network, you can also do other kinds of network. You can do email and H HTTP, you know, web browsing and file transfers. Nothing that live wire does breaks an IP network, so it's fully compatible. Uh, you do need to use uh, Ethernet switches that are high performance and work very well under a big, big load because I tell you, uh, every live wire stereo stream in a live wire network is about five megabits per second. It's very low latency, and uh, there are a lot of packets involved in doing that. But this is what, for example, the Twit Network uh, has been using. Not for this show. They're moving to their new place. They're back on an analog system, but they'll be back on an, their Axia console uh, in just the next uh, w week or two. Um, hey, I have helped people install audio over IP consoles uh, in their studios for several years now, and there are now over 2,200 Axia consoles out around the world. Uh, right here in Singapore, there are some. And there's plenty across the USA, in Mexico, Canada, France, uh, even a big broadcaster like Energy in, in Paris, France. They've installed now what is now the largest Axia IP audio console. Um, from the largest to the smallest, the folks at Axia have come out with now some much less expensive IP consoles. The IQ, for example, starts out at eight faders. You can expand it to 16 faders or even up to 24 faders. And that console starts about $8,000 US. Then there's the uh, new Radius console, just going to be shipping starting next month, with it, which is eight faders, not expandable, but it's just $6,000 US for a Radius console. These consoles, just plug together using uh, an ordinary piece of Cat5 or, or Cat6 cable. In fact, here in Singapore at the Broadcast Asia Expo, uh, I and two of my colleagues, uh, Peter and Ken, we built three studios in eh, a day and a half. And that included unpacking all the gear, racking up all the gear, uh, replacing all the screws that had uh, rusted in the salt air and the storage here in Singapore. Uh, so it, it, we actually could have done it a lot quicker if we, uh, if we had been able just to put the, put the gear in. Three studios, though, in a day and a half, fully configured and operating at the Singapore uh, Broadcast Asia Expo. So I invite you to check it out on the web. Go to axiaaudio.com. You can download the big catalog. You can look at the white papers and understand how audio over IP uh, works in terms of, of uh, live wire. Lots of partners, lots of possibilities. Check it out, axiaaudio.com. All right, let's um, move on with our conversation. We brought Jim Roberts into the show, and Jim's with Broadcast Electronics. And so, Jim, I want you to, to uh, tell us about the, the – we, we talked about metadata, uh, the radio experience uh, products that, that you offer. Kind of give mm -hmm. us an overview, and then we'll dive into some, some deeper questions. 
Sure. Well, uh, the Radio Experience product is, we kind of like to think of ourselves as digital plumbers. Um, we handle all the, the metadata at the station and, and send it out where it needs to go when it needs to be there. Um, so uh, TRE, the core product, talks to your automation system, whatever that is. We like to uh, think we're automation agnostic. We work with just about anyone out there that will work with us. Um, and we take that metadata as you play the event, and we send it out wherever it needs to go. If it needs to go to your audio encoder for streaming, if it needs to go to RDS um, for your analog display or 4HD, wherever it needs to go. We even have plugins that will send that data to Twitter. Um, uh, you know, you can hit Facebook with that data in real time. And then it interleaves or mixes in with that um, scheduled messages, like promotional messages, um, you know, what's going on in the midday, uh, messages about features coming up. Um, whatever you want to work in there, and it, it'll even um, tie metadata to your commercial spots, and, and you could get some non-traditional revenue from that by charging a little bit more for the data display, a phone number, or a coupon code, or something like that to go along with the audio broadcast. And then our new product that, that kind of evolved out of um, the radio experience is uh, Crowd Control, which is an interactive product that actually allows listeners um, to vote on songs and affect uh, what plays next. So that, that's really kind of an overview. Yeah. So by what method does a listener get their vote back to the, the computer, the station, whatever's keeping um, track? Well, we uh, it would be through your website or for mobile app. We have iPhone apps. We have Android apps. Mm. We're working on a BlackBerry okay. app. Um, and then it, it presents to the listener. You can control what gets presented. So you can have, if you just want to do it for like a feature set, like you're doing a top eight at eight and you only want to have 20 or some songs in there, they can vote on those 20 songs. Or... You could run it in actually what we call total control mode, where every song in your inventory is available to play at any time. And whatever's playing right now is always the top voted song by the listeners. So as they're engaging on the website or on the mobile app, as they vote for songs, the system figures out which the top vote getter is at that time and actually feeds it back into your automation system in real time. You know, I'm, I'm looking at the website, and the website for broadcast electronics is bdcast, bdcast, yes. as in short yeah. for broadcast, dot com. And uh, I'm, I'm looking here at, at the, uh, in the products, the, for the, the studio products, and the, um, uh, the TRE, that's the radio experience. Um, hey, tell us, uh, uh, I had a little bit of experience with the radio experience. Uh, mm -hmm. They were partnered up with Telos for a short time and then um, uh, apparently found a, a better, quicker, uh, more responsive home over there at Broadcast Electronics. Tell us about, is, is Alan Hartle still involved with this uh, uh, project at all? Um, we, we purchased the company from Alan, uh, I think, ah. in 2006. Um, okay. and, and he worked with us for a short time after that as a contractor, but uh, he's off and he's, he's got his own company now called jump to go So he's, he's, uh, he's doing jump to go Okay. Yep. All right. Yep. Yep. Well, in, in looking at, at, the, at the TRE products, the first thing I notice here is the TRE core engine. Mm -hmm. And it does I, some of the things you were just describing uh, here. It, it uh, does basic scheduling, now playing data from uh, automation systems. Uh, it, it formats the data for unique destinations, I guess, like for RDS or for your web or your, your, your Twitter sure. feed. And here's something that helped me understand this. Interleaves pad and non-pad. What does that mean? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, uh, pad data is program-associated data, and non-pad would be data that's not program-associated data. So that would be anything that doesn't really directly relate to the audio that's playing. So mm -hmm. um, by interleaving, you know, a three- or four-minute song is a long time to show Justin Bieber over and over again. Um, so every 30 seconds um, during the interleave, or you can actually set it to whatever you want, if you want to do it 15 seconds, uh, 45 seconds, whatever, um, it'll rotate between the messages that you've predetermined to be displayed on your, your RDS, your HD, or your web, um, and the title and artist. So it'll go back and forth between the two. And then okay. that gives you right. the opportunity to get more data out there, you know, during those songs. Um, and then, besides this uh, core engine, there's an area that's called TRE plugins, where uh, <laughs> other uh, like social networking sites are mentioned, and things like traffic flow and TRE cast and Twitter tagging. Kind of take us through what some of these things do. Well, um, we also make an effort to kind of integrate the the TRE core engine with as many different data providers as we can. So there are traffic plugins that'll get you traffic information um, from Navtech and interleave that with your pad data. So as people are driving along watching the title and artist on their screen and responsibly driving along and watching the title and artist on their screen. Um, <laughs> sure. They can get traffic information as well. 
uh, or weather information. Um, and then we have different outputs that we work with as well. And, and Twitter tagging is a unique one that we came up with. And it was kind of in a quest to solve this um, problem with tagging in that um, over the air tagging, where you have an mm -hmm. iPod device or a Zoom device and you see a song play, you can tag that song. And then later when you sync your device with iTunes or in the case of the Zoom, they have the marketplace built in, you can actually purchase that song from, from iTunes or from the Zoom marketplace. But it, it requires that you have uh, a device that supports it. And right now, as far as the iPods, it's only the Nanos. And with the Zune, I, I mean, you know, they're lagging a little bit in popularity, and now they're discontinued altogether. So we wanted a way for, you know, people with Blackberries and Androids and, and iPhones and even on their computer to be able to tag songs. So the way Twitter tagging works is TRE, as your automation system plays a song, will actually take that information, look it up in iTunes, um, and then get that URL back from iTunes, and then actually take that URL and shorten it, and then post it to Twitter in a real-time feed of everything you play. So Twitter now uh, is available, obviously, on BlackBerry and Android and just about every portable device out there and on any cell phone as an RSS feed. So as you play that song, they can actually favorite it in Twitter, and then when they get back to their computer, they can click the iTunes link to download it. So it's, ah, it's kind of our okay. way to take tagging onto every portable device possible. One person in the chat room is asking about extended RDS. Do you know what that means? Um, yeah, there's, uh, there's different parts that are kind of added on to RDS. There are different groups you can send data in. Um, mm. RT Plus is, is a popular form of uh, kind of extended RDS, and RT Plus is actually the way analog tagging works on the Nano. And what RT Plus is, it's a new field um, that pulls portions of data out of the existing radio text field and labels those. For, so, for example, um, the common data display on RDS is, is called radio text. It's 64 characters in length. And if you were to say on your radio text, um, call the station now to request a song and put the phone number, uh, then in RT you could tell the receiver that, hey, the station's phone number he starts at character 15 and ends at character 25 of radio text. Pull that out uh -huh. and buffer it. So huh. now the receiver would know, would have a button to, to recall the station's phone number, and you could get that out of the receiver's buffer. There's, there's just tons and tons of those RT Plus tags. They've got them for phone number, for URL, um, for weather information, for stock information. Um, so it's a way you can kind of get more data and buffer it in the receiver. And incidentally, it's the way the tagging works on the Nano. Um, you send an RT Plus trigger that says, hey, the title is this portion of the radio text, and the artist is this portion of the radio text, and then the nano knows that this is the title and this is the artist. Oh, okay. All right. All right. Now, is, that sounds a little bit difficult to, uh, to set up. Uh, I, I take it the software, you know, gives you some tools to, to make all that happen um, for the average, average engineer. Yeah, it's, I mean, in, in the radio experience software, it's really easy. It's really just a, a clicking a button and saying, you know, I want to I do RT+. Plus. Um, it's a little more difficult in the um, RDS encoders because you actually have to say, okay, you're going to expect data to look like this, and, and this is where your artist is, and this is where your title is. But it's really, it's, it's not nearly as difficult as it sounds because as that information comes in from the automation system, it, it comes in as a title field and as an artist field. It's really only... Yeah when it gets to radio text that it all becomes jumbled and you have to sort those fields back out. So, okay. All right. It's pretty simple. Uh, so something else mentioned uh, plugins uh, for weather now. So I guess mm -hmm. you can what uh, transmit current weather. Uh, yeah, it, it's, it's current weather information. We have uh, TRE operates in, in what we call a tree link protocol and it's uh, a single TRE application at a station has the ability to talk to other TRE applications at the station and other external t applications that aren't TRE like a weather plugin. So for example, if you had a, a group of five stations in a market, um, you could have all the TREs running for each station in that market, but then you would have a weather plugin that gathered weather information, just a single weather plugin for all of those. And as each station wanted to broadcast that weather information, it would go back to that single plugin and say, hey, What's the weather? So weather now is it's just a it's an additional application for TRE that that aggregates weather data and makes it available to any station in your market over TRE. 
earlier in our discussion here, you, you had mentioned um, uh, the social networking sites like 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 uh, uh, Facebook and and uh, you know, Twitter service. Um, the the Web 2.0 plugin. Can you take us through some of the things that that will do that maybe you haven't touched on yet? Yeah, it uh, it's what powers the Twitter um, tagging actually, and it it does a similar thing for Facebook and. Um, but we do that through actually Ping FM. If you're not familiar with Ping FM, it's a, it's a web company that takes your data for anybody. A consumer company takes your data and passes it out to any social network you want. So we provide data to those, um, to Ping FM, and then through that, it's a free service for the radio station. They can pass that out to Facebook or uh, even MySpace or instant uh, messenger status messages. You could post your now playing to that. If your night guy used IM, the status could always be the current playing song. So it does those, and then we do Last FM as well. Um, it's kind of neat. You could register your station through Last FM, and it would create a profile on your station. And you know, one of the things Last FM does is it you know matches up people with like-minded interests in music. Um, your station could actually be a part of that matching. So your station would be just listed as another Last FM user, but everything you played um, would get uh, scrabbled to Last FM. Jim, can you give us an idea of what kind of penetration uh, that RDS has nowadays? And now, you know, years and years ago, I did some engineering in France, and boy, they were certainly using RDS, but they were using it for primarily for alternate frequency and format identification, such that you know their broadcasting model is a bit different than uh, than ours in the U.S. Uh, they had a number of lower powered transmitters, you know, a kilowatt or 250 watts, spread out over a, an area in France, and you could tell your radio, hey, I want to listen to in this case I was working with a company called Vibration and you, I want to listen to Vibration and as you drove around it was a, a dual headed uh, you know dual tuner mm -hmm. Uh, a car that car radio that would always look for a stronger signal of the same you know uh, the the same identifier and would switch over to whichever was signal was stronger. It did this seamlessly or virtually seamlessly. This was pretty convenient. Uh, they weren't put using it for any uh, text uh, readout on on the radio though. Now in the U.S. Um, seems that we are more interested in station identification, call letters, uh, um, you might do program type, but then also promotional announcements, as you've been talking about. But do, does the public, uh, is the public very much aware of this? What kind of pickup do you feel like is out there among average listeners? Um, you know, I, I don't talk to average listeners as much. Um, I, I think in the last seven or eight years it's it's really caught on the big boost for rds was was when satellite radio came out and and uh -huh. they had title and artist and we didn't and at that point we saw you know everybody all the stations just saying how do we do this you know why are we doing this already even though the technology had been around you know eight or nine years prior to that um stations in the u.s hadn't really caught on so um really that's been the drive uh, initially was just you know, to compete or stay um, up there with um, satellite radio. And early on, there was a study, I can't remember who did it, but um, that was the number two reason in this study that, that people preferred satellite radio, the people that did preferred it over terrestrial, was that mm -hmm. it had title and artist. No commercials was obviously number one. Um, so that was a big push. The other thing with RDS is as soon as one station in the market gets it, they all follow up pretty quickly um, just to stay competitive. Um, so that, you know, that alone, one market gets it in, in, in short order, the rest of the market has it. Uh, there still are a lot of smaller markets, mid to smaller markets, that, that nobody's doing RDS. Um, Quincy, there's only two stations that do RDS at all, and, and actually I set those up for them. Um, so it's catching on still, but there are still a lot of stations out there that, that, that are just, I don't know if they're oblivious to it or don't think it's important or, or whatever. Well, Jim, Jim, it's Chris. If mm -hmm. I'm a station, say, you know, like you say, a small station or a station in a market that's not doing it, what's the cost? I mean, cost, total cost of ownership. You're talking, you know, hardware, or well, maybe in your case, it's all software. But, you know, I'm looking at what I'm going to do: software, hardware, engineering slash IT time to install, transmitter calibration for the RDS subcarrier. Do you have a rough idea if I was, you know, a, a station owner? And somebody said to me, you know, you should be doing RDS or at least getting in that world because you can generate some revenue in other, you know, ways. Mm -hmm. what, what would somebody expect? Because I think sometimes people are gun shy, if you will, because of the cost. Or they're not aware of the cost or they think it's beyond their, their reach. Can you give some insight to that? 
Yeah, um, the software, I, I mean, with TRE, with all the different plugins, um, you can kind of add to it as you need. It's really kind of a la carte. So if you just wanted to start off with basic um, dynamic RDS with title and artist, um, the software starts at like 600 bucks for that. Um, now you're going to need an RDS encoder, and, you know, there's some cheap ones out there that, that, that do okay, and then there's, you know, anywhere from probably under a thousand up to a couple thousand based on what you want to do. Obviously, if you're going to do RT plus and tagging and some of that alternate frequency stuff, you're going to need a, a better encoder. But if you just want to get RDS on, there's some really um, low end RDS encoders out there that you can get for probably just right around a thousand dollars and be on for under a couple grand with RDS. And, you know, with the tools that the TRE has in it for advertising, I mean, you can you know, sell a message to your advertiser. TRE will actually track that for you and tell you when it ran and, and report that back to um, in an Excel spreadsheet for your advertiser. We've seen stations or entire groups that have, have set up TRE throughout their entire group and had it the software actually paid for within six months just by the advertising that it provided them through RDS. That makes Probably, sense. Yeah. Now, if I'm running a website and I want to integrate, you know, the RDS, the TRE, and, and tagging and stuff, how much more does the software, you know, what do I expect to, to have to invest in that side of things? I'm curious on the, we'll call it the web side of the RDS equation. You know, what can radio stations expect? You know, the large groups, it's a given. You all allocate funds and whatever. I'm talking about the, the independents, the more meat and potatoes broadcasters. You know, what, what, what should somebody expect to be able to, you know, like, uh, you know spend? Mm -hmm. Well, um, with, with TRE, the pricing is, is pretty simple. Um, if you're doing an output that allows you dynamic messages, such as uh, generic messages and things. Um, it's six hundred dollars per output for each license per output. So if you want to do web, um, that's six hundred dollars. Now for the plugins like Twitter, um, if you're going to post to Twitter, that's that's not posting your generic messages. That's really um, pad data only, or or your title and artist information only. Um, and, and the reason for that is you most likely have another Twitter feed that you're sending out messages to your listeners on. You, you wouldn't want to put both on the same Twitter feed or it would just be a fire hose of information that, that your listeners wouldn't pay much attention to. Um, but those type plugins, if you're going to feed it to a streaming encoder, most likely they're not going to want all the generic messages. They're just going to want title and artist. So those type of plugins range around $200 each. And then if you want the more advanced online message management packages, um, that's around 1000 for, okay. for each output. So it's still relatively uh, not, not expensive, but... Yeah, right. that, no, that sounds really it, it, modular. It, it, it's a cost. If the station can build this exactly to how they want to operate, what information that they want to provide. And by the way, Jim, I'm glad you said that about the Twitter feeds, that you wouldn't want this fire hose of, of information, you know, the song title every few minutes, an artist and, and the tag, uh, you know, to be on your station's main main Twitter sure. feed. I, I, don't yeah. want, I may want to see that for a few minutes or I may want to search for it, but I don't want to see it all the time. Yeah, yeah, you don't want it interrupting the, the same feed you're posting your promos to and, and everything else. What do um, what do talk oriented stations do about RDS? Have you seen something creative? Uh, maybe even getting into uh, the uh, where the caller is calling from or what's being discussed at the moment in, in terms of subject matter. Well, um, part of the the scheduling system within TRE allows you to actually schedule program information um, based on time. So you know if you do a midday show or whatever or a talk show, um, it can be sending out that information during the show. Uh, one of the other plugins we have is called TreeCast, um, and that is actually a studio application that allows the on-air talent or producer or whoever to type in information, set a duration on that, and then send it out to TRE, which then processes it to all the outputs in real time. So if you had a caller that was on the line, you could, you could put that information on TreeCast and send it off to TRE in real time. A little more manual than automatically getting it from a schedule or from the automation system, but there are certainly tools there uh, that let you do that. You know, I was thinking as long as a, a talk show is likely to have a uh, a producer of the show, someone who's mm -hmm. you know taking calls, typing in it, somebody who's available to perhaps enter a quick message now and then uh, into one of your your softwares, such that you can say, hey, right now we're talking about the gubernatorial uh, race in Kentucky, or right now we're talking about the uh, the sewer referendum uh, in in the city. Mm -hmm. Depending on you know how local the the show was, that might be kind of interesting. Of course, interspersed with your station's phone number or your website. Sure, sure. For some uh, some reactivity from the from the audience. Uh, hey, we ought to spend uh, just a moment because um, we haven't talked about this a whole lot. 
spend a moment describing technically uh, how RDS works in the FM broadcast system, that it works perfectly with you know, analog, simple analog uh, FM. It's not hard to implement. Um, the, the software that, that uh, the radio experience from broadcast electronics has, this uh, uh, software provides data in what either a serial format or an Ethernet uh, IP format, and this data then uh, goes to, is sent to, or is picked up by uh, the first thing in the, in the chain would be an, an RDS generator, uh, which takes that data and formats it. Um, Jim, can you describe for us what, what comes out of the RDS generator and where does it go from, from there? Uh, sure. I, I mean, to the best of my knowledge, um, I'm more on the software side. Um, but what, yeah, what TRE does is it, it takes the data and just sends an ASCII string um, to mm -hmm. the RDS encoder, which then uh, encodes it into the audio band um, in, in a segment that's you know, set aside or a group for RDS. Um, no, I got you. I, I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to put you on, on the spot there. That's right. um, this, uh, yeah, this, the signal that comes out of the RDS generator is um, uh, uh, was set up specifically for this kind of data. It's, it's, it comes out right. as a, what, what's called a subcarrier. Uh, yeah. it's, a, uh, it's centered at 53 kilohertz. 57 kilohertz. I'm oh, yeah, sorry, 57. 57, 57 kilohertz. And so it's a, it's a signal of 57 kilohertz that um, is um, it's frequency modulated, right? And this frequency mm -hmm. modulated signal at 57 kilohertz uh, contains this data, um, uh, you know, ones and zeros. And then so this RDS 57 kilohertz signal is then fed typically by, uh, by small coax, like, uh, you know, RG58 coax. Uh, it, it's fed into... Um, typically the FM exciter. So it becomes, mm -hmm. it, it's mixed in with the rest of the FM baseband. On a previous show, we described how FM stereo works. So you have your left plus right and your stereo pilot at 19 kilohertz, and then your left minus right signal, which is uh, this dual sideband suppressed carrier thing centered at 38 kilohertz. And so that now then there's this 57 kilohertz carrier, that a subcarrier that gets added to that baseband. All of that then, the left plus right, the pilot, the left minus right, and now the 57 kilohertz signal, all together are called the baseband or the composite signal, and that goes to the FM modulator in the exciter, and the modulator modulates all of that at the same time onto some FM carrier, whatever frequency your, your station is licensed for, and all of this is carried then uh, you know, through the air and picked up by a receiver. So a receiver then, its job would be to first pick up the main FM signal and then demodulate that. When it demodulates it, it demodulates it into this baseband once again. And then for other parts of the receiver then work on the different things. The, the stereo decoder will decode the left plus right, the stereo pilot and left minus right and give you left and right. And then another decoder built in the radio will decode the 57 kilohertz RDS and turn that back into the data that was shoved in on the other end. And then the you know, standards-based uh, uh, parsing in the radio receiver will uh, take that data and decide what to do with it. Oh, should I look for alternate frequencies of this station? Uh, should I, look, should I uh, display that this is a country music station or a rock station? Uh, or should I display on the screen? Ah, here's the title of the song, the artist, and, and whatever other information that the, the station wanted to display on that screen. So I think I've taken you there from yeah from beginning to end mm -hmm. of of how this stuff ends up on uh, on your on your radio screen is through this 57 kilohertz uh, subcarry and again that's the job of the hardware that develops that um, sure. so all right uh, so that that being said what's uh, what would be uh, uh, next to discuss in in terms of what listeners can experience um, uh, from data that's put out by by uh, these the software aggregator and message scheduler. Um, well, if you want to talk more on the, on the HD side, uh, one of the things we're working on now is the artist experience, um, which is uh, new from Ubiquity, the ability to display pictures um, or album art on the receiver. Um, and that's, you know, that's not fed through some back channel of Wi-Fi or anything like that. It actually comes over the air um, as part of the HD stream. Um, so we're actually testing that in our lab right now, and we hope to be in beta in the next couple of weeks and then rolling that as a product in the not-too-distant future. But it, it's really exciting for broadcasters because uh, the thing we've seen in especially uh, car stereos is the displays keep getting bigger and bigger. They're getting more things ah. on them. They've got GPS, um, and, and we're lagging behind with pad data there. 
But now we've got the ability to fill up that screen um, with not only album art, we can have our logo, we can have pictures of our staff and uh, advertiser uh, pictures there as well. And at some point in the future, maybe even weather maps, things like that. So it's, it's really an exciting technology um, for radio. You know, radio now has pictures. So that's exciting. <laughs> Imagine that radio with, with, with pictures. Hey, <laughs> um, uh, uh, Chris, uh, you and you and uh, 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 no. Uh, Jim has some graphics to show, so why don't you two discuss these graphics as uh, as Burke uh, shows them? Uh, if Burke has them available, Jim, you can describe what's uh, what's on the screen along with along with Chris. Okay. Burke, are you ready? There we go. What's what's yeah, this? This is actually uh, the crowd control product that we talked about earlier, and what you're seeing is uh, kind of a mock-up for what a station's website might look like, or at least um, this portion of the website. And you can see the song, uh, it's not the song that's currently playing now, but it's one of the top vote-getters there in the right-hand corner. Um, th and the listener can vote for that. They can vote up or down, whether they like that or not. Um, they can skip it, or they can uh, you know, hear a sample of it or buy it from iTunes or buy it from Amazon. Now, I'll tell you, um, a listener would typically log into this with uh, you know, Facebook or Twitter, however they log in, whatever um, OAuth they're using. Um, log into this, they get the opportunity to vote. They can share with other listeners there on the left-hand side what they're voting for, encourage them to, to vote for other things or vote down songs. If they really don't want to hear that Justin Bieber song, they can tell all their friends to vote that song down. Um, and then these votes, as they happen, are fed back to the um, servers in real time, and it always picks the top song at any given time. So whatever the top vote-getter is is the next song the station is going to play. It's really fun to watch it. Um, it, it integrates with, with your automation system and it's really fun to sit there and watch the automation system and that next up song to keep changing back and forth as uh, different people are voting and songs are getting dropped and songs are coming in. You can actually change the next song seconds before it airs. So as you're there in the automation or in the studio watching the automation system, it's fun to watch that song play. Um, then there's a complete rule system built in here as well, which I know is important for programmers out there. We're not going to present to the listener any song that would not pass your rule system you've already put in place. So we have your standard separation rules. Um, we have your offset rules. So if you played Justin Bieber yesterday at 10 o'clock, you're not going to play it again today at 10 o'clock. All of those rules are built into the system, but rather than um, allowing the listener to vote for a song and then denying them because it doesn't match a rule, we just don't even present that song to them. There's also on that interface a search box, so you could search for any song um, that you want to vote for, but that search box is only going to um, show you songs that pass the rule set for any given time. Uh, so that's, that's, cool. yeah, that's an example of uh, the in-control um, interface, uh, a total control, I'm sorry, the total control interface, an in-control interface um, on your website would just show up for the time that voting is taking place. Like if you're doing a top eight at eight, maybe from seven to eight o'clock, people get a vote for songs, and then at eight o'clock you play those back. Um, that would be a little different interface. I don't think we have an example of that today, um, but that's a, another example of uh, how crowd control can be used. Um, what we're looking at now is uh, uh, the, stig the DJ wall, and this is an interface that allows, I think if you click... Uh, uh, there on the right, you can view a wall. I can't real see, see the links real clearly, but there should be an option there to view um, the wall on the far right. Uh, maybe not. Oh, we sign now. Um, but what this is, is um, this is the DJ wall, and it allows the on-air talent to communicate with the listeners across every different communication channel you have available to you. So if you're on Facebook, if you're on Twitter, if you have a mobile app, um, all of these devices. So if you click uh, edit wall right there at the, or, or I'm sorry, um, yeah, right, or yeah, that one. Nope, the other one. View wall, I believe. There, there we go, that's where we want to be. Um, so this is real-time communication coming into the studio from any listener that is communicating. Now it's either via Facebook, it's via Twitter, it's via SMS. The DJ wall aggregates all of this communication in real time and presents it to whoever's on the air at that moment in time. So if the DJ wants to reply to one of these messages, they just hit reply and it's going to go back out the exact way that it came in. So whoever's on the air doesn't have to worry about whether that was a Facebook message. They don't have to have Facebook open. They don't have to have Twitter open. They don't have to have um, uh, some kind of texting application going. They can do it all from this one interface. 
Uh, the interface also will aggregate voicemail. So you could set up your studio line to go to voicemail. Those voicemail messages would, a bit, would appear in here and could be played back on the air if you want or not. Um, one of the other neat features about this is it keeps a history of communication, any communication you've had with that listener. So let's say um, some Facebook listener uh, two months ago won tickets to a concert, and today they've sent you a Facebook message to request a song. You could send a message back to them and say, hey, thanks for the request. By the way, how was that concert? They're obviously going to think you remembered that, but no, it's, it's right there on the DJ wall. You can see the, <laughs> the history of that communication, so you know that it happened. Um, this also integrates with the crowd control wall that we saw a minute ago. So communications that happen here between the listener and the DJ that should be public can be posted back to that public wall. One of the so other essentially, features... Uh, go ahead. I was say, just with these products, essentially you can have the listeners control the music as it's played, or is it still the jock intervention, uh, or you have a choice? I'm just trying to make sure I get my head around this. Um, with the crowd control, uh, the system will actually do it for you. So the jock okay. doesn't even, doesn't, the, the system actually feeds the songs back into the automation system in real time. One of the other neat features about that is the system will recognize if no one's voting. So if it's, you know, 2 o'clock in the morning and no one is voting for anything on the website, the system will recognize that, register itself as a voter, and start picking songs and playing them, again, based on your rule system. So it could almost act as a real-time dynamic music scheduling system as well. So you wouldn't have to even schedule music if you were running in total control. The system would do it for you in real time. And that would be based on what the listeners decide to, to select and, and vote on, correct? Well, yeah, um, correct. Yeah. But if the listeners are not voting, if there's a period in time where nobody has voted, right. let's say in the overnight, the system's going to recognize that and become a voter itself and start picking songs. Right, right. So the, now, the this computer's system... going to start picking its favorite songs. Yeah. Y yes, yeah. Okay. Dave. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so this system, would that sit... Uh, now I have to think of in, in terms of infrastructure for a lot of our folks in the audience that are the, the technical type. This sits on the same LAN or subnet as, say, my automation system for the studio, or you can cross through routers. I mean, what's the back, the back office end of this implementation? I've got, sure. say, in the case of Audio Vault, I'm running either, you know, say, Audio Vault Flex, and now I'm going to run, you know, Crowd Control and some other stuff. Does that sit on the same? audio server as my flex or is it actually a separate system then it just talks across the network because you know in our operations we have a lot of vlans and a lot of security and mm -hmm. six radio stations running all kinds of audio vault programs each one is a separate it's not talking to the other unless we permit certain ports sure. access so sure is the implementation straightforward or you know do you get in trouble if you put it on your office land with your automation if that's your setup just curious you know firewalls uh, we, dmz's yeah, we really tried to make it flexible um, to, to just that reason in mind. You know, there's a lot of stations that don't want to put their automation system uh, on an exposed network, understandably. Uh, so we allow you to set up a gateway system that will really be the control between the crowd control server and your automation system. And, and that's, it's pretty much just like running uh, TRE software or any kind of data casting software that's getting information back from your automation system. Um, it's going across some network to the radio experience software, which may be on a dual home machine or through some gateway or something like that. And then from there, it's going out to the Internet. So the commands coming in to tell the automation system what to play next work the same way. They come into some gateway, and then that gateway sends it across your network, um, however it needs to get across the network to the automation machine. And no, based perfect. on the automation perfect. system, it, it, it's, it, it works different ways a little bit for different automation systems. For example, in the case of wide orbit, um, they run a, a server that kind of maintains all automation systems within the um, location. So we actually talk to that server, which a lot of times already has that gateway set up for it. Oh, so okay, we, perfect. I just tried to keep. I've had applications mind. where they have to reside on the same physical server as the primary application they're talking to, and I just sure. you know, I get nervous when you have to do it that way, and then expose it to the outside world for interaction. So okay. Gotcha. Well, you know, not only uh, security reasons for the station and, and what's in your best interest, um, you know, being automation system developers ourselves, we kind of want to think of that system as sacred, and we certainly don't want any other program like crowd control to be responsible for or, or held responsible for possibly pulling that down. So we try to keep right. that right. safe. That makes sense. 
Guys, we have uh, exhausted uh, a little over an hour here, and I want to give uh, uh, Jim, first of all, thanks for being with us and explaining all these things. Jim, is, the, is there anything else that we haven't covered you feel it's essential to, uh, to give a, a, a couple minutes to? Um, I don't think so. We've, we've kind of covered just about everything, I think. If folks want more information about um, the radio experience and uh, maybe you have some white papers or other uh, manuals describing uh, the processes involved here, where can they go? Yeah, um, there's all kinds of information on our website, um, bdcast.com. And if you can't find it there, you can always email me directly, jroberts at bdcast.com. And I'd be happy to talk to you and help you out. Good deal. Good deal. Chris, you got anything else? Any more questions? No, no, Jim's answered them all. We actually use pretty much a lot of the products except for the new crowd control and uh, total control stuff. But, uh, yeah, the TRE and all the features and various things, we use it now. Uh, we're doing the flex and the old traditional AV100 stuff as well. Uh, but, no, it's, it's, uh, I think we did cover enough that anyone who has an interest or an inkling uh, should definitely reach out and contact them. And you'll find out that they're very good people to and support, and they're uh, quite open-minded when you have some crazy questions and uh, suggestions. <laughs> Well, I sure appreciate hearing from uh, from Jim. Thanks very much for being with us, Jim, and uh, sharing your expertise with us. It's good to hear from from someone who you know knows the subject matter quite well and thoroughly. Well, thank you. No problem. Glad to be here. All right. Well, and glad to have you back uh, anytime you guys have an improvement or something really new to to talk about. Sure. We'd love to have you back. Sure. All right. Take care. Hey, this episode of this week in Radio Tech has been brought to you by Axia Audio on the web at axiaaudio.com now shipping the new IQ console and pretty soon about to ship the Radius console. Hey, thank you for tuning in. You can always get uh, back um, back episodes of our show on uh, the Twit website at twit.tv slash twirt, T-W-I-R-T, which stands for This Week in Radio Tech. You can also go to the, uh, those pages and subscribe through any number of different ways, iTunes and RSS feeds and uh, other ways to, uh, to subscribe to these episodes, either audio or video, and you can watch them right there live on the website or download them as well. There it is, This Week in Radio Tech on the twit.tv website. We're so thankful that uh, Twit is hosting us and also thankful to uh, Burke McQuinn for... Uh, switching and producing uh, our show for us. Thank you very much, Burke. Appreciate it. That's, uh, that's it. I'm in Singapore next week. I uh, hope to be back in the USA and in, uh, in my office. We'll have another exciting show for you next week. Thanks also to Chris Tobin for joining us. Chris, appreciate seeing you. Oh, no problem. Back here in New York City with the storms passing through and the humidity rising, doing just fine. Sounds like Singapore. <laughs> there we go. We'll see you. <laughs> there we go. We will see you guys next week on This Week in Radio Tech. Bye-bye.